Good morning, sunshines. Today, we're gonna to talk about lighting design. Yay! Uh, now, I don't mean to slight costume design uh, by not talking about costume design, but uh, really, other than coordinating, maybe color, maybe period, uh, maybe style in the sense that uh, if you're doing a 15th, 16th, 17th century uh, design where you have people with peignets or hoop skirts, you have to deal with that sort of getting through doors and things like that. For the most part, costume designer works separately from the set designer. Uh, whereas the lighting designer and the set designer are gonna work pretty much hand in hand because well, you're using the same space. Uh, usually where the flies are above the theater, you either have an electric or you can have a fly system that involves the scenery. And so there's a great deal of coordination between the two design elements. So it's helpful to spend a little time. Again, there's an entire class on lighting design. I'm not gonna try and teach you to be a lighting designer today in class, but at least let you understand where the lighting designer is coming from so that you can have a basis for uh, strengthening your argument uh, if you need a, a, to move something to a different place or have something happen at a different rate, speed, that sort of thing. You can at least talk uh, coherently to that person. Yes. Um, first of all, there are five things that a lighting designer deals with. They, 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 they can make five different choices in the course of designing the lights. The first is the type of instrument they're going to be able to use. I'm going to show you two basic instruments. I'll tell you about five uh, and how they're used. Uh, the other is direction. When they figure out their light plot, they're going to figure out which angle they're going to come from. There's a man, Stanley McCandless, who developed a system back in the 20s and 30s when electrical lighting first came into vogue uh, that is still the basic system for most lighting designers today. It even though there are other options within that and other people may, you, the mechanics is where you start from though. The color of the light, you can uh, add color to it uh, through gel or through uh, various LEDs or different colors as they exist. Uh, you can change the focus on it. You can make them a hard focus or a soft focus or in between. We'll talk about a little bit about how to do that. And the intensity, when you cue the show, when you put the cue in the light board, we'll talk more about lighting the show in a little bit with the light board. Uh, you, as you adjust the light cues, uh, light cue is any change in a lighting level. Uh, and so you're gonna need, if, if the lights turn on when, uh, when the, the refrigerator door is open, you have to have a light cue for that. If the light turns on when somebody walks in the room and flips the light switch, you have to turn the light on for that. If dawn happens and the sun comes up or the sun goes down, you have to have a light cue for that in order to make the light intensity change or the color shift, that sort of thing. So anytime there's a change in the environment, lighting wise, that's a light cue. Uh, so, uh, and you'll deal with those in tech rehearsals. First of all, just to talk about a couple of types of instruments, the most common, the most popular nowadays, is what's called an ERS, an ellipsoidal reflector spotlight. Uh, they are also sometimes called uh, Lico's because a company named Lico, L-E-K-O, uh, de developed this back in the 20s. Uh, really, it was the reason why McCandless was able to come up with his system because one of the things about an ERS is it focuses and fine tunes the light. Uh, again, there's a little uh, diagram here that shows you exactly how it does it. It's through a system called an ellipsoidal reflector. In other words, an ellipse is an oval. Uh, three-dimensional oval, uh, and everything that comes out of the light source, the, the light energy that travels toward the object may, is, continues to go toward the object, but the light energy that's going away from the object is gathered by the reflector and sent through to a second focal point. The nice thing about that, and again, here is an exact uh, living example of an ellipsoidal reflector spotlight. This is an Altman Fest spotlight, ERS. Uh, a couple things, this is a C-clamp. Uh, you can adjust this. Again, you're gonna have your crescent wrench uh, on a lanyard to help so that you can tie this to your uh, belt buckle so you don't drop it off from the grid. Uh, but you can use this to adjust the C-clamp. You can adjust this to use, and again, there's some little levers here on the side that you can use to take the C-clamp down. This is called the yoke of the instrument. The yoke is, can be raised, lowered, that sort of thing. The way you take the back off, there's a little thumb screw right here that lifts the back off. And if you have a lamp that is bad, you can take the back off and you can see that there's a, a lamp inside of it. This is the, uh, what's called a lamp. This slips right down into the reflector spotlight and you just screw it back on. And then that's how the reflector uses the power from the lamp to, to uh, reflect the instrument. Um, at the second focal point, you have the opportunity to put in shutters. These are shutters which can shape the light. You can also put in gobos. A gobo is a little piece of tin. This one has stars on it, yay for stars. Uh, this one has a window on it, so yay for windows. And then you can just slip this down into the, sh the, the, 
the shutter slot, and then you can focus onto that. There's a little knob right here. The front of the instrument is what's called a lens train. The lens is on the inside, and you can loosen this, and the lens train can either go out or go in to sharpen or fine focus or to, uh, to dull the focus. All those are different ways of focusing the instrument. So once you've figured out what instrument you want, if you want to use an ellipsoidal, where you're going to hang it, I'll show you a little video here in a second about how to hang a lighting instrument. Uh, but then once you've hung it, then you can figure out your focus. Then you can attach, you can put in a colored gel. There's a little gel frame with a little blue gel in it. Yes, the gel just comes right back out. It's uh, often called a filter because it filters the light. So you just put, change the filter, put that into the front of the instrument, and you can change the type of color that it is. There are two basic bases for, for lamps. Um, this is called a uh, uh, bifocal, bifocus base. Uh, you can see there's a couple flanges here. It flips in, slips in, there's a little spring in, inside, and then you turn it a quarter turn and it holds. This one's a little more popular, it's just a pin base, two little pins there. And you can see there's a little crimp there. There's a little uh, piece on the inside that sort of crimps down and holds it in place. But this is just a pin connector as opposed to the box the by base I'm going to take this out and then the other type of instrument that we use is what's called a Fresnel. A Fresnel is as opposed to a ellipsoidal or ERS which is used to fine-tune the light and make it very sharp. Uh, this is a Fresnel. Again you can see the Fresnel lens. The way this is a little bit easier, a little less complicated instrument, you just pull that little pin right there and it flips open and there's your lamp inside. Again, your pre-focus base, you can sort of see the flange in there. You can switch that back in. The lens itself has got rims on it, so that what it does is it takes the light, and this was actually developed by a man named Auguste Fresnel, who was a light, uh, spotlight, I mean, excuse me, a uh, lighthouse operator. And he tried to, to flare off the light as wide as it could so he developed this lens that allowed the light again that was going this way to go through that way. But the light that was going out here, he honed it in to make it a nice soft light that uh, the ships could see more of the light as it spread out along, among the sea. And so the th theater designers took it, put it into a lighting instrument. And so whereas this light is meant, meant to fine tune the light, this light is meant to spread the light. Yes. Uh, which are basic two types of instruments you can choose between. Uh, there are also these things called park hands. Park hands are extreme, extremely durable. They, if you're using outdoor lights, uh, they are uh, uh, all encased in the same uh, lamp, uh, lens, all that is all in one. Uh, and so it's very durable for out, so outdoor lighting, that sort of stuff, uh, for concert lighting, for quick uh, directional lighting. Uh, they also work well for colored uh, moods and that sort of thing. Uh, strip lights, again, nowadays, uh, old school, when you went into your um, uh, uh, auditoriums, you would have these huge strip lights that run the battens above your head and they had glass um, um, frames in them that had the color lights. You had your red, blues, greens, yellows in, in them. Uh, nowadays, the strip lights are usually LEDs. Uh, LED lights are um, light emitting diodes. They come in seven different colors, depending on, on the type of metal that you're, you're using to transmit the, the uh, electricity. Um, the problem, they're, they're nice and pure and clean and bright. The problem is as you get to the lower end of the dimming curve, which may not make any sense to you, but as you get them to turn to go less and less bright, they start to flicker a little bit, which uh, incandescent lamps uh, such as these, when you have uh, tungsten, as it as it goes to the lower end, or as you get it dimmer and dimmer, it dims very nicely through the lower end as it cools off. Um, LEDs sort of jump around, flash a little bit, so they're still tr improving that technology. Uh, but those are the basic choice. First choice, what a type of instrument. Second choice, where to hang it from. Again, here's a little um, introduction to the mechanical system. Lights are a very important resource in the theater industry. Obviously, they allow you to see the actors and what they're doing, but when used with skill, they can also set the mood of a scene. We're going to show you how to light a stage using something called the Stanley McCandless Method, a lighting technique created by Stanley McCandless. He was a theatrical lighting consultant from Chicago that went on to create one of the most commonly used lighting methods today. But more about that later. First, you need to know how to hang your light fixture. There are a few pre-steps you need to perform before you go up on your ladder. 
The first is to get a wrench. Make sure that there's a wrist strap or idiot string on it so that you don't drop it. Next, get your ERS light fixture. Now that you've done this, you can get up on your ladder. Once you're up there, the first thing you need to do is finger tighten the seat clamp on the ERS until it is snug on the bar. Then, take your wrench and do a one quarter to three quarters turn until it is very tight on the bar. Just be sure not to over tighten or else you won't be able to get the fixture off. After the fixture is snug on the bar, you need to attach a safety cable. Simply attach one end of the cable to the fixture, wrap the other end around the bar, then attach it to the fixture again. The fourth step is to attach the barn doors and open them. However, on this fixture, you won't be needing barn doors. And finally, you plug the fixture into the power outlet. Your fixture is hung and ready to go. Now that you know how to hang a light, you also need to know where to put them. One of the most commonly used lighting techniques in the theater is the Stanley McCandless method. It is focused on five points of light. Backlight, which is light from behind the actor. Side light, light coming from the sides of the actor. Top light, light from above the actor. And key and fill light, lights that are angled in front of the actor. Backlight, side light, and top light are all used to give depth and dimension to the stage and the actors while key gives a warm feeling and fill light provides a cooler mood to the stage. However, in the film industry, key and fill are different. In filmmaking, key is your brighter, more dominant light, while fill helps light up any shadowed areas. Once you have those five important points of light ready, your stage should look a little something like this. You've got to go. Hopefully this video has taught you how to hang a light fixture and properly light a stage. Thank you. Yay, a couple of high school students can do it, you can do it. Uh, the basic idea is that you're gonna create various areas of lighting. Again, we'll show you with the light board here in a second how that creates uh, the light on the stage. Uh, but on the map of the stage, you can see that we come, come up with some areas, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And then you have uh, six different lights pointed at each of those areas. You have two front lights at 45 degrees from each other. You have two side lights from 90 degrees or 180 degrees from each other. You have a down light from above and you have a back light from behind. And between those six lights, two from the front, two from the side, one from the top, one from the back, you have what's called 180 degrees of coverage. So that you can make a person look like it's in daylight and brightly lit with the front light and the side light, well with all of them. Uh, you can look so, uh, make a person look mysterious by hiding them, putting them in silhouette with just the back light. Uh, you can uh, shape them, which is what the side light does, shapes them a little bit. Uh, again, the top light separates the person from the background. And so if you need to punch a person forward, just turn on the back of the top light, uh, which, a lot, which doesn't like the background, but does like the actor, that sort of thing. This was the basic idea behind them. Uh, the second layer of lighting design is to create the mood or the atmosphere, which is mostly done through color. Uh, texture can also be used when we talk about gobos. You can add different textures to it. Uh, but usually if it's nighttime, it's dark blue. If it's uh, sunrise, it's, uh, you've got the oranges and the reds that come up. Uh, if you're creating something that's happy, it's more pink. If you're creating something that's sort of morose or scary, uh, it can often be red, that sort of stuff. If somebody's in love, passion, of course, a little, little, little bit uh, more lavender, that sort of thing. Uh, also specials, as you consider, as a line designer is considering the show, they'll look for times when they can use gobos or when they can use um, uh, flash lights uh, strobe lights. Uh, you can also, uh, a lot of theaters have uh, backdrops that have stars in them. Uh, and so there are this handful of little tricks that at light designers have in their bag that they can bring out smoke, even though it's not necessarily electrical, it's something that can be controlled, a smoke machine can be controlled through a light, light board. 
Uh, and so things like smoke or uh, snow, snowflakes, so oftentimes have snow machines that can be controlled by a light board because you have to turn electricity on to make it work. Uh, so those would be called special effects. Uh, and then any kind of special lights, for instance, uh, a practical, we'll talk about practicals, uh, lamps, if you have a set designer, and this is where you really coordinate as a set designer and a lighting designer, when you're putting lamps on stage, when you're putting sconces on stage, when you're putting the light in the refrigerator, when you're putting the light in the radio, when things turn on, so that you can make the reality of the moment look like it's actually happening, when in actuality, it's just theatrical magic that's making all those things happen. Never trust an actor to actually turn the light on. It's always done through a light cue on a light board. That's just for you to know. Um, the uh, again, the, the light cues are done uh, during tech rehearsal. Uh, usually, there are well, there are three basic types of tech rehearsal. Uh, one is where you just have the stage manager and the director. Um, those are called dry techs. You just sit down and discuss where in the show the light cues go. Again, as a set designer, it is often helpful to know where the light cues are going to be. Uh, so even though you may not have to physically be there when they're talking about it with the director, it is helpful to have talked with the line designer so that you know what the line designer is going to attempt to do so you don't put a piece of scenery in their way when they're attempting to do it. Oftentimes, coordinating offstage spaces, like if the line designer wants to have a light boom, which is uh, something that stands up on the floor, you have light on, lights on. Uh, if you have a wagon that rolls off stage, you have to figure out how wide the wagon is to fit between the booms. Uh, in certain shows, certain things win. So for instance, if you're doing Peter Pan, flying wins. Peter Pan has got to fly. And Peter Pan flying on a line needs, means that you can't have any scenery up there, you can't have any lights up there. Uh, so again, it depends on what type of show it is as to what the importance is, whether it's scenery, scenery that wins or lighting that wins in a particular moment. Uh, again, the better you can coordinate with one another, the better everybody can be happy. Uh, but as you're going through your, your cues, then you have your cues that, that involve everybody but the light, but the actors. Uh, I call them wet techs, uh, but those are where you have scenery move. Uh, uh, never, the first time you have a, a scene shift happen on stage, you should always have it happen in light. In other words, don't have the light cue happen because you need all the technicians, all the actors, everyone to know what's gonna happen and how things move so they can understand how dangerous things could be. Because again, once you turn those lights out and you have actually things happening in the blackout, again, you should have glow tape available at all times to glow tape things so that actors don't run into things and things don't run into actors. Uh, but you need to have, have them experience the set shift and the light cue was gonna be in the tech rehearsal first and then do it in light, which usually means it's blackout. Uh, a lot of times lighting designers can add a little blue light or a little gobo light. Uh, to add a little bit of visibility. It's amazing how much having an offstage uh, glow, uh, clip lights, that sort of stuff, it helps the actors to see on stage, but also doesn't let, allow the audience to see what's happening on stage. Um, anytime you have a shift that happens where the audience can see the shift happening, it's called an obvious to shift. My rule of thumb is seven seconds. Uh, you can do a show, if you can do a shift and without any danger to anyone in seven seconds or less in a blackout, fine. The thing about it is an audience will start to lose the train of thought and start thinking about things like dinner or what they're doing after the show or stuff, other stuff if it takes longer than seven seconds. And so if the, if the shift, if it takes 10 seconds in blackout, turn some, some lights on so that people can see it, have it be an obvious to shift, and then they can at least be entertained by watching the shift happen. Uh, again, a lot of times directors can be helpful in this matter because the director can choreograph scene shifts where you actually have stage crew happen walk, walk, walking around in actual costumes, that sort of stuff, which makes costume designer very happy. Uh, but again, figuring out those solutions to how those things happen is how you coordinate, collaborate with other designers. And even though you do coordinate, and again, in that last instance, collaborate with your set with your costume designer, mostly the person you're having to deal with with all these uh, different changes and shifts is the line designer. Cool, again, quick tutorial. Uh, we're gonna cut uh, to the, working with the light board uh, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Sure. Uh, welcome to the light board, yay. Uh, there are a couple things about it you need to know. First of all, one of the buttons you can use, which you probably should not use, is this little button called the blackout button. When the blackout button is on, nothing will work because the blackout button has been pushed. Uh, so one of the first things you wanna make sure is that blackout button is off. Yes, yay. Uh, then, uh, first of all, these are all called uh, faders. Uh, these are submasters, particularly here at the bottom. Uh, these up here control individual lights on the stage. 
So whatever is plugged into circuit one happens there, whatever in two happens there, whatever in three happens there. And so these are the individual circuits that are up on the grid as the lights are plugged into each circuit. Yes, some are front lights, some are down lights, some are back lights, some are mood lighting, some are specials. Anyway, there one there's a, we have 155 circuits out there uh, that we can plug individual lights in. And again, the way you shift from one, this now becomes 41 through 80, 81 through 120. So you can switch and change which of these faders control which. We're back to one through 40 now, just to keep it there. The submasters down here have taken these individual circuits and combined them into their areas. So for instance, in, in the, the graphic that I've shown you before, you have area A, B, C, D, E, and F. And so I've got area A, B, C, D, E, and F. Yes, we also have G, H, and I, but that's because we have a bigger stage. I'll stick through A through F. And so what we have are, bring up area A, we have two front lights, two side lights, a down light and a back light focused in area A. And so those are down right, down right. Area B is down center. Again, two front lights, a back light, down light, side light, side light. Area C, stage left. It looks like a couple lights are blown out, uh, 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 blown out but that's okay. Uh, area D, we're not gonna show this week. Area D is up right. Area E is up center. And area F is up left, yes. Uh, and so you can create from your dimmers you can combine, and again, I don't know which of these, uh, let's see, where does, where does uh, the, the number, circuit three goes into area A, and so you can see that three is up in A, but it's also up when I bring in, uh, oh, it's area five. Ooh, which one has three? Four, I guess three is extra. Yay, five goes to area A, and then when you bring up area A, it's also included in the submaster, yes? And then as you can combine, as the, act, the actors move about the stage, you can bring up various areas to bigger or slower dimensions, and then you record each of those looks into individual light cues. And the way the show works is once you have the shows recorded, and again, you can see that we've added the color to this and the gobos to this, so you have the whole overall light cue happen. But that's preset when the audience comes in, and then the first thing that happens is the house lights go to half. Then you have what's called the Katie light come up. Katie is our uh, introduces our plays and, uh, and tells people about the fire marshal and all that sort of stuff. And then the Katie light will go out, and then we'll have we'll go back to a blackout to begin the show. Uh, and then you have the actual act light happen on the stage. Yes. And so the, theoretically, once the show is gone through a tech rehearsal, all the only button that the light board operator will have to hit is this go button. Yes. Uh, again, it's more complicated than that, but for set designer purposes, that's pretty much all you need to know about how this works. All right. Thank you all very much. We'll see you next time.